So what about performance? So we've got a rationale for perhaps why to test. We've got a rationale for the underlying physiology. Where does all this sit in relation to athletic performance? Well, here's some, a quote from Ekblom. And Ekblom is, again, very prolific in cardio respiratory physiology. Hemoglobin concentration at rest and during exercise and that's the oxygen content in the arterial blood, CIO2, which we saw last week, in well-trained athletes is no different than that in untrained individuals of the same sex and age. Okay, so that's really important. Hemoglobin concentration is almost identical between training status um, and gender. Now, this is quite neat, because this shows us what happens when you take blood volume out. This, this is a great example of, of why you don't get somebody to, to train, unless you are doing some research study, um, after donating blood. Because here we've got um, work time, and here we've got maximal O2 consumption. They've given, um, they've donated the blood, they've taken out about, it's about 500 milliliters, about half a liter of blood. So you've got individual responses, but look, here's where they were. Look at the drop within the first couple of days. So imagine you're asking somebody to exercise after blood donation. They've reduced the oxygen carrying capacity. So their ability to use oxygen, the VO2, is reduced, which means their work time, how long they can sustain this for its constant load exercise, is also reduced. But what are you noticing? With these, what's happening to them over time? They're going back. Why? You are restoring the blood that you've lost. You naturally replace it. And what you're seeing here is why blood doping works. Because after 28 days, they're back to where they were. Now look what they've done. They've put the half litre of blood back in that they took out over here, and look what's happened to VO2. You just increase the oxygen carrying capacity. So we get a natural resynthesis of blood cells because the body is releasing a retropotent. So if it's releasing a retropotent over this time, what must be higher in the, in the circulatory system? CO2, you're checking it from somewhere. So CO2 remains raised because it, we are not meeting the supply, of, uh, meeting demand. So over time, this is showing you, even though VO2 is going, it's showing you that we must be restoring red blood cell concentration because we're getting back to where we were in terms of performance at the top and oxygen consumption at the bottom. And then this is just showing you when you reinfuse that blood what happens. Pretty neat example. <coughs> the other very important thing about it is hemoglobin. So, if we're going to move oxygen, we're talking about moving oxygen, we're actually talking about moving it from the circulation into the muscle, into the cell. So that means we've got to move it based upon pressure gradients. The pressure in the lung has to be higher than the pressure in the circulatory system to pass the oxygen from the lung into the circulation. The pressure in the circulation has to be higher than the pressure in the cell to allow us to move the oxygen from the circulation into the cell. So there has to be an association between hemoglobin and the partial pressure of oxygen. Two are absolutely linked. So the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen is dependent upon the partial pressure for that oxygen. So if the partial pressure falls down here, look what happens to the amount of O2 we've got on the red blood cell. It decreases. So this explains why when we move to the periphery, that the partial pressure starts to fall. Because you don't want the oxygen bound to the hemoglobin molecule, you want the oxygen in the cell. So the oxygen is released because the partial pressure starts to fall 
we start to release the O2, and it's, it's then taken up at the cell. But the pressure has to be higher in the circulation for oxygen than it is for the cell, otherwise you cannot release the oxygen to the cell. But it's feedback mechanism. That association between hemoglobin and PO2 is reflected by the association between CO2 and PCO2. Because the CO2 concentration during exercise is it increasing or decreasing? Is it increasing or decreasing? Is CO2 during exercise increasing or decreasing? It increases. As that starts to increase, we now need to get the CO2 out of the cell. So the, PO2, sorry, the PCO2 is higher in the cell than the circulation, which allows you to move the CO2 onto the red blood cell. The PCO2 is higher in the circulation than it is in the lung, which allows you to pass the CO2 from the circulation into the respiratory system. And the partial pressure for CO2 is higher in the lung than it is in the atmospheric air, which allows you to expire CO2 out in the breath, which is what you are recording when you do your exercise tests. But all of this, all of these pressure gradients, all of these changes in the release and uptake of O2 and CO2 are driven by the, the, the rate at which the mitochondria is working. The rate at which we need to produce ATP. We need ATP because we need muscle chain length. Because you want to do work. So the mitochondria is producing the ATP under aerobic conditions to meet that demand. But it's aerobic. It's oxygen dependent. So that means we have to release oxygen into the cell to allow the mitochondria to do its work. And the harder the exercise intensity becomes, the greater the stress that's placed on the mitochondria, because you need more ATP. Therefore, we have to release more oxygen. And we therefore produce more CO2. We have to get more CO2 out of the cell. And just to show you, this is quite nice data, um, the association between hemoglobin and VO2 max. So you can see, if you've got a low hemoglobin concentration, that's the ability to carry oxygen. doesn't matter how many red blood cells you've got, if your hemoglobin score is low, you cannot carry the oxygen, you won't have a low VO2 max. If you've got a high score, bearing in mind we talked about, UCI said about 17 was a cutoff, so if we go up to say, the 14s, 15s, you can see, look, you get much, much higher VO2 maxes. The two are inextricably linked. We've got some slight rogue data points, but the two are inextricably linked. <coughs> this is some quite nice data from Will Hopkins' group um, down in New Zealand. And what they've measured here are changes in, in hematological responses in the morning and the evening. So this is morning, this is evening, and you can see they fluctuate over, over the day, but what you would know is by the time we start the day again, the pattern repeats. In other words, yes, you get daily variations, but they remain constant over time. Okay. So plasma volume shows very, very different um, responses from the AM to the PM. As does iron concentration, as does hemoglobin. So don't make the assumption. We saw in that data from the cycling group that it fluctuates over time, or they fluctuate over time. They fluctuate on a daily basis as well. And the final thing is this. Can blood volume change during exercise? <coughs> and the simple answer is, yeah, it can. We know that it's about a 20% reduction in plasma volume during exercise. Not because you suddenly sweat it all out. That might contribute about half of 1%. 
Most of it is because the fluid has been retained by the cells for cellular process. But that's reducing the plasma volume, it's making the blood slightly more viscous, but it's not reducing blood volume per se. We get about a 10 15% reduction within the first few minutes, and then start the equilibrium. But the one that is startling is this. You get about 2 to 3% reduction due to foot strike. So if the foot hits the ground, you compress red blood cells. It's like pushing a bubble wrap. <coughs> They're collapsed under the pressure. And if you run a marathon, you get about 2 to 3% reduction. So that's a 2 to 3% reduction in red blood cell count. So that's a 2 to 3% reduction in VO2 max in the course of a marathon. And we ran a study last year, the third year study last year, where we looked at what happens if you make people run to this response barefooted. Because barefoot running is the new phase, it's the new craze. Everybody's in the barefoot running. Okay, well they're using the Nike, the Nike sock shoe. What happens? So we have people run for half an hour. And it does, it causes the greater compression of red blood cells running barefoot than it does shot. But we know that people who become habituated to running barefoot would see just the same response as people who are running shot. But if you've never done it before, because there, you've got less control and put greater force through, you get greater compression. So you're going to have a higher oxygen cost as the race goes on, irrespective of cardiovascular drift, irrespective of increases in core temperature, your cardiac output is going to increase, your O2 cost is going to increase because you are losing a lot of volume. 2-3% to doesn't sound like that's a massive reduction. Massive reduction. <coughs> And the final, final graph. <coughs> I think. Um, it's just to demonstrate this. And this is the thing I want you to think about. I'm going to put this on the discussion board on the VLE as to why I want you to think about it. Is the two lines, so you've got three and four, two and one go together. So two and one is what we call moderate exercise. Three and four is heavy exercise. One and three represent pre-blood donation. Two and four represent post-blood donation. In other words, they've had half a litre of blood taken out. But despite taking half a litre of blood out, in this period of six minutes of exercise, there was no change in the oxygen cost of doing work. So the question I want you to think about that I'm going to put on the discussion board is, how come? How come, with half a litre of blood missing, there is no change in the oxygen cost of doing work? It's the brain's ticking over. Okay. We'll leave it there. Make your way down to the labs, please. Make sure that you're in the same groups. Get your participants ready. Make sure you're wearing the perfect kit. <coughs> and make a start. <laughs> and I'll meet you now. <laughs>